All right, welcome to CS2050. This is a little quick thing before the exam. I'm going to do two quick proofs today. Um, last time we talked about proof by induction, talked talk about proof by strong induction. Uh, so this is just one last proof by strong induction that I want to do because it's fairly complicated. It could take like uh, its own little thing. Um, uh, we used proof by strong induction last time to um, prove the closed form of recurrences and give, uh, you know, you have a sequence of numbers and then it turns out you don't need to compute them recursively. This was like 2a and minus 1, minus a and minus 2, plus 2, something like this. And then we said that, oh, well, we could just do this with n squared. We don't actually have to, to compute the 1,000th uh, number in the sequence. You don't have to compute the function 1,000 times. Just compute it once, right? That's the benefit of a closed form. There's another recursive sequence that everyone should know. Everyone has thought of first before they heard this term recurrence. What is the only recurrence that you may have ever known? Fibonacci. Fibonacci's. F of 0, F of 1, right? Fibonacci numbers are defined how? F of 0 is 0. F of 1 is equal to 1. F of n is equal to what? Yes. Uh, and this is for n greater than or equal to 2. Would you believe me if I told you the Fibonacci's had a closed form? Well, the Fibonacci, the closed form of the Fibonacci is that the for n greater than or equal to 2, that, well, actually for all n, for n greater than or equal to 0, that the nth Fibonacci number is exactly 1 over the square root of 5 times 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 to the n minus 1 over the square root of 5 times 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 to the n. Now that is like an ugly, big, long formula, but uh, we're going to be able to prove by induction that it's correct. All right, can you guys see that? Good enough, right? Um, one of the things about induction, it doesn't really have good, any good, sometimes it doesn't have any good explanatory power. Like, where does this formula come from? Why does it have square roots of 5 in it? Uh, we're not, we don't know any of that. But we'll be able to prove the correctness by induction. So, like, I give you this formula. You have no idea where the formula came from. Yet, I, because of the nature of proof, I can still convince you that the formula is true. You'll be, after this proof, you'll be convinced the formula is true. You'll have no idea where the formula came from. That's one of the interesting things about proof. You can actually derive the formula. It's not too hard. It takes a little bit of linear algebra. You can derive it without linear algebra. It takes like 10 minutes to do it. But today, we don't have those tools. We're just going to use proof by induction. All right. Uh, questions before we begin? Before I do so, I'm going to uh, prove a little lemma. What is this number called, 1 plus square root of 5 over 2? Anyone know? It's got a name. This is the golden ratio. I'm going to denote it as 5 plus. Does anyone know the name of this one? 1 minus square root of 5 over 2? This one's not a question that I know an answer to. I don't know what it's called. But I've been calling it the anti-golden ratio or the silver ratio or something, right? It's, I don't actually know the name of it. So I'm going to use a 5 minus for this. Uh, I don't know what it's called. Um, but, sorry, what? The pyrite ratio? I'm not going to call it that. Pyrite right. is fool's gold. Fool's gold. Oh, the pyrite. I thought it was like pyrite. Okay. Pyrite ratio. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. We're going to call this one uh, phi plus, and we'll call this one phi minus to make things easier. Okay? Um, then we can rewrite f of n to be 1 over square root of 5 times phi plus to the n minus 1 over square root of 5 times phi minus, uh, excuse me, phi minus to the n. Okay? Um, the golden ratio has, and this anti-golden ratio have a property. We'll prove this as a lemma. Um, uh, phi plus phi minus, here's our lemma. Give me a second. Uh, phi, uh, lemma, phi plus, phi minus are the only numbers, uh, solutions with this property. That if you square the number, uh, it's equivalent to adding 1 to the number. So golden ratio has many interesting properties. That's one of them. Taking the number and you square it, it's the same as adding 1 to the number. Uh, here's the proof of the lemma. Consider we find the polynomial x squared minus x minus 1 is equal to 0. We're looking for its solutions. How do you find the, the roots of a quadratic? 
quadratic formula. Does anyone remember the quadratic formula off the top of their head? Minus b plus or minus squared. b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Correct. So then you have a is equal to 1, b is equal to negative 1, and c is equal to negative 1. You plug those in. The plus or minus are going to give you exactly these two. So the golden ratio and the anti-golden ratio, uh, whatever the anti-golden ratio's real name is, pi right ratio, those are, they are that, the way they are because simply there's solutions to this equation, in fact. We'll use that to our advantage later. But know that the, um, by our little lemma, that if we have phi plus squared, that's equal to phi plus plus 1 and that phi minus squared is equal to phi minus plus 1, right? Those are the two, those are two solutions to that. Um, right, let's begin with the proof. Uh, we have base cases. How many base cases do we need? Two. Two. We need f of 0 and f of 1. Uh, we, let's prove uh, this, right? So for base cases of n equals 0, if n equals 0, we have f of 0 is equal to 0. And we have our formula is 1 over the square root of 5 times 5 plus to the 0 minus 1 over square root of 5 times 5 minus to the 0, which is equal to anything to the 0 is what? 1. So this is 1 over square root of 5 minus 1 over square root of 5, which is equal to 0. So we're good on that case. n is equal to 0. It's done. n is equal to 1. Uh, we have f of 1 is equal to 1, so let's plug 1 into our equation and hope that we get 1 back out. We get 1 over the square root of 5, phi plus to the 1, and I'll write instead of phi plus, I'll write it as it's supposed to be 1 over square root of 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, minus 1 over square root of 5, uh, 1 minus square root of 5 over 2. I may rewrite this as... 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 square root of 5 minus 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 square root of 5, right? Now I'm just going to combine, because they have the same denominator, we're going to get 1 minus 1 plus square root of 5 plus square root of 5 over 2 square root of 5, which is simply equal to 2 square root of 5 over 2 square root of 5, which is equal to 1, right? Work a little quick on that. Um, I'm being a little expedient through the uh, arithmetic, but you could probably do it, right? You see the, the case, what, it, what, what happened there, right? So we see that case of n equals 0, n equals 1, we're good. Um, induction hypothesis. Uh, uh, our induction hypothesis, we, we're going to do the induction step now. Suppose. Uh, uh, for all i, that i is between 0 and some k, for some k, that f of i is equal to f of, uh, excuse me, not f of i minus 1 plus i of i minus 2, that's given, but is equal to 1 over the square root of 5, phi plus to the i, minus 1 over square root of 5, phi minus to the i, right? Um, we will prove, we will prove that uh, f of k plus 1 is equal to 1 over the square root of 5, uh, phi plus to the k plus 1, minus 1 over the square root of 5, phi minus to the k plus 1. Right. So let's just begin with f of k plus 1. We have f of k plus 1 is equal by the recurrence. We know this is just f of k plus f of k minus 1. Agree? By the induction hypothesis, we have closed forms for f of k and f of k minus 1 as 1 over the square root of 5, phi plus to the k minus 1 over the square root of 5, phi minus to the k plus 1 over the square root of 5, phi plus to the k minus 1, uh, minus 1 over the square root of 5, phi minus to the k minus 1, right? We have, got, we have four terms, uh, two of the same of the, of the golden ratio, two are the same of the anti-golden ratio. Let's combine these terms. So let's pull out as much as we can from this and this multiplicatively, okay? We can pull out from this what? We can pull out a 1 over the square root of 5. We can also pull out a phi uh, golden ratio to the k minus 1. So we're going to get phi k minus 1 
times whatever's left over plus whatever's left over. Nothing is left, one uh, phi plus is left over here. Nothing is left over here. We agree. I undistributed a lot in a single step. I undistributed phi, one over square root of five, uh, phi plus to the k minus one from both these terms, right? And I'm left with a single phi plus here and nothing here. Let's do the same for the minuses. We'll get a minus. We can distrib undistribute a minus. We can undistribute a square root of five, undistribute, factor out. Um, here we're left with a phi minus to the one plus one. Oh, excuse me. One over the square root of five. Phi minus to the k minus one. Phi minus plus one. Do we agree? Any, any qualms, any questions so far? In the, uh, the algebra, was, I skipped a couple lines, but we believe it to be true, right? Okay. Um, what do we know about phi plus plus one? Uh, phi squared. Correct. Let's carry it home. One over square root of five, phi uh, plus to the k minus one times phi plus squared by our little lemma, one minus, similarly, one over square root of five, phi minus to the k minus one, times, not phi minus plus one, but phi minus squared. Let's combine terms, and we're gonna get one over the square root of five, um, times phi plus to the k plus one, minus one over the square root of five, phi minus to the k plus one which is exactly what we want. That's exactly what we asked to show, right? We will prove, and then look at that, it's the same. So by strong induction, uh, we have proved that uh, for all n, that the nth Fibonacci number is equal to one over the square root of five, 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 to the n minus 1 over the square root of 5, 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 to the n. QED, right? Crazy, crazy closed form. One of the reasons I love this proof is because that doesn't look anything like a Fibonacci number, right? Isn't, you're not even sure that, that that's a rational number. You're not even sure that's an integer. I mean, like, the, what, what is, how do you know whenever you factor this out for any n, somehow the square roots and the 1 overs are always going to cancel out? Somehow that works. We don't, I don't know how that works. I just like looking at it. I would have to do an n foiled out or something and then sh ensure that everything like cancels out perfectly. It's not obvious to me that occurs, but because we know the Fibonacci numbers are numbers, they're like 10, no, uh, not 10, 1. What are the Fibonacci numbers? 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, uh, 5, 8, and so on, right? These are always natural numbers. This is somehow always a natural number, kind of weird. Doesn't explain to me, I mean, it, it, the proof by induction, you should be convinced that this is always the Fibonacci number, but why is it a Fibonacci number? Where did that formula come from? We're not sure. I mean, it doesn't, the proof doesn't explain that to you. you could, it, it would not be too hard for you to derive this formula in, in a proof that does explain where it comes from. Any questions on that? All right, I have one more. Yes? The, the strong induction step was when you plugged in for f of k. And so induction would only, if we're trying, induction would only apply, uh, assume uh, f of k is the form, and then you try to show f of k plus 1. Strong induction you show for all the cases, 0 through k, it's true. So here, strong induction is what's needed because although we would get f of k has the closed form by induction, we would not get f of k minus 1 to have the closed form by induction. So we would write f of k minus 1 using, uh, we need f of k minus 1 to have a closed form by strong induction. And that, that is given to us by strong induction. So like we would write like um, by strong induction f of k is equal to the. Yes. So you, we could say by, oh yeah. So here's, this equals, when I write this on the board, I'm not over explaining something that you should do on a submission. When I, when I, this equals sign, I, all the things I'm saying out loud also should be written down by you. 
by the strong inductive hypothesis, we know that f of k is equal to this. And also by strong induction, we know f of k minus 1 is equal to this. So therefore, this plus this is equal to this plus this. Yeah, good question. Induction proofs must follow a uh, special syntax. More questions on the Fibonacci proof? All right, let's do one more quick thing. And I'm going to do a wrong proof by induction. And you guys are going to point out where uh, it fell apart. Uh, theorem, which we'll prove incorrectly, all horses are the same color. Obviously, something false, because you can easily find a counterexample, but we'll give a quote-unquote correct proof by induction, and you're going to find out the flaw. We know this to be false, though. Not all horses are the same color. Um, we proceed by induction on on the number of horses. It's always polite to say what you're actually inducting on. Sometimes it's obvious it's called n, and you're like inducting on the nth Fibonacci number. It's not obvious sometimes what you're inducting on. And there's all kinds of diversity of things. You're doing proofs on binary trees. You, you can induct on the number of nodes. You can induct on the depth. You, know, you can induct on the size. Things, you, it's, you have to declare what you're inducting on when it's not obvious. 90% of the time, it's obvious. But this theorem is not like obvious what we're inducting on. So we just have to declare it. Declare it. Uh, base case, one horse. Uh, if we have a set of one horse, are all the horses in the set the same color? Yes. OK. Induction hypothesis, any set of k Horses all have the same color. Okay. Assume that any set of k horses all have the same color. Consider, and we'll prove that a set of k plus 1 horses have the same color. Um, consider a set of k horses. Let's call it uh, h1, uh, h2, h, uh, I don't know, uh, k, h, k plus 1. Okay? We have k horses, right? Consider the subset. This is k plus 1 horses. Consider the subset h1 to hk. Uh, by the induction hypothesis, they all have the same color. Okay. Uh, consider the subset. h2 to hk plus 1. That is a set of k horses. So by the induction hypothesis, they all have the same color. Horse 2 has same color as h1 through hk, and same color as h3 to hk plus 1. So if h2 is the same color as h1 through hk, and h2 is the same color as h2 to hk plus 1, then they must, of course, all have the same color. h1 through hk plus 1 all have the same color. Q 
QED? Question mark. This is not correct. Obviously, you can easily find a counterexample of two horses that are different in color. But this appears on the surface to be a correct proof by induction. It falls apart, though. Let's take a second to see if you can guys find an error. There is a couple, maybe, but let's try and find the main error. Yes? When you said that any set of K horses all have, like, how are you able to, to like, say that? That is by the induction hypothesis. Uh, when you do a proof by induction hypothesis, you don't actually question where the induction hypothesis gets for it. It's the assumption, and then you conclude it, it's true for, recall, you're trying to prove that uh, phi of k implies phi of k plus 1. Al although we know that the induction hypothesis is obviously false because the whole theorem is false, it's not incorrect for us to assume the induction hypothesis is that. You could do induction backwards uh, uh, in a more complicated way, but let's not think about that. This, what we did is we took a, a thing of size k plus 1 and tried to form it as a recurrence in terms of things of size k so we can apply the induction hypothesis. And that was not an issue itself. Um, k plus 1 may not belong to the any set k. Um, well, suppose I worded it as any set of k plus 1 horses. These are good comments. But I'm looking for the one core issue. You use the induction hypothesis on the H2 to the HK plus 1. But HK plus 1 can't be used in the induction hypothesis. Um, HK plus 1 is the K plus 1th horse. It's just one horse that I happen to name that. And I could have described this in a way that did not index the horses in that way. I would say that's just a set of K horses. Here's the, uh, you guys want another guess? Or I'll, I'll tell you the answer. The answer, you have a guess? Like, how do you uh, keep iterating, like, forward? Um, what do you mean? Yes, I thought, like, the K plus 1 should be, like, the next one. It is, yes. So I assume that any set of K horses all have the same color. Every single possible set that contains exactly K horses all the elements in that set have the same color. Now consider any set of k plus 1 horses. From there, I'll deduce that k plus 1 horses must all have the same color. Here's the, um, the thing, is that what I did was I split, the, I split the set in such a way that only works for n greater than or equal to 3. So if we have h1 to, the, to let's say, h2, Da, 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 to hk minus 1, excuse me, let's say hk, hk plus 1. What I did was I took this set, right? And then I took this set. And I did so in such a way that there exists an element in the intersection of both sets. And I basically, what I didn't write down, but I basically did, was say I partition, not partition, but I create two non-empty subsets of the sets of horses such that they overlap, right? But this does not work for n equals 2. You cannot create two non-empty subsets of a set of size 2 elements that overlapped. Right? Suppose h1 and you have h2. There's nothing that's shared between them. So you don't get this. Here we use h2 as the element in both sets. So it's like, oh, look, you buy transitivity because this is the same color as this. This is the same color as this. They all have the same color. That doesn't exist for the set of size 2 horses, right? So in fact, what this would, this would have to require would be a base case of two things. It would have to be, because the induction hypothesis actually relies on there existing at least a third element implicitly, it doesn't say that out loud, but that's what's required of the proof, that a third element exists, I would have had to prove more base cases. But unfortunately, the base case of n equals 2 is obviously false. So the induction proof should not have been able to succeed. This is also another example of sometimes why writing a proof is, it can be subtly incorrect, because I don't state all my assumptions on the table. When I write it in a certain way, I'm not describing everything that could possibly happen he ever. But implicitly, the, ma the mistake is implicit. It's just sort of in the background radiation, but that's why it's wrong. Right. Questions on this example? Do we get why it's wrong? 
Excellent. Excellent.